tons of news coming out of CES. And one thing is we're finally getting an actual official release date for AMD's fluid motion frames. So let's start here. Frame generation has been on a lot of people's minds and there's a variety of, of options, right? You have DLSS 3 frame generation, which is limited to only NVIDIA's RTX 40 series GPUs, and it needs to be directly integrated into a game. We've then had FSR 3 go open source and be integrated into at least a few games with more on the way. But again, FSR 3 frame generation, while it's available on more GPUs, pretty much any GPU can at least try to run it with newer GPUs from both AMD and Nvidia running it you know, better and more successfully, it still requires integration into a game directly. AMD has led the way with a uh, driver level option, AMD's fluid motion frames, which is not the same thing as FSR 3 because it's not directly integrated into the game. So it doesn't have access to as much game data. So its quality is frankly not as good, but it has the ability to be added into basically any DX11 or DX12 game through the driver level. However, it hasn't been officially released yet. It has been in available for a long time though in preview drivers. And so a lot of people have been wondering when will it get its official release into the main line of AMD drivers? And it is now looking like that will be the case on January 24th. And uh, it's sounding like the company expects a competing solution from Nvidia. But in the meantime, there's actually an interesting uh, topic going around, which is uh, the lossless scaling app, which you can buy on Steam for $6.99, which has been updated uh, very recently to include frame generation, and this can run in pretty much any game on pretty much any graphics card. Now, is it any good? I haven't been able to test it myself yet, but I do have a lot of details on this. Today's more of a news video, not a testing video. I'm interested in testing this. I've just been too busy for now. However, um, I was curious about it, so I, I, I did ask for more information uh, from someone who uh, works on this app. I don't think he's the only developer on it, but he's actually, I've, I've talked about this app before and tested out on the channel when it was originally uh, updated to uh, allow uh, applying FSR 1.0, the spatial upscaler, to pretty much any game uh, back before we had things like RSR to do that. Anyway. Um, but uh, I, he did reach out to me through email with some details on the project and I asked some questions and did get a bit of a reply. So I actually wanna talk about this a little bit. So what's going on with this? First of all, um, basically what is it? So this is more similar to AFMF, AMD Fluid Motion Frames, than it is to FSR3 or DLSS3 because it does not have a direct integration into a game. So the game's kind of unaware of it and it has less access to data. So it's just going to be doing a frame interpolation. So it won't produce as good of results as a game engine added frame generation. Um, also, it says there's still improvements being made and the biggest focus would be to get HDR working. So uh, that would imply that HDR is currently not working. Um, they're saying their main advantage over AFMF is it doesn't disable when you pan the camera and it uh, supports a wider range of GPUs. So what this is talking about is uh, AMD's fluid motion frames, uh, when it I think it's when it detects too large of a difference between frames to do a good interpolation, which can happen on fast camera movement, especially when your frame rate is low, it just kind of gives up, which can feel a little bit stuttery or weird. Um, they're saying that this one just doesn't do that. It will always interpolate a frame. Uh, they're saying their biggest downside is it requires a stable locked frame rate. So this will not, uh, I think, be a variable refresh rate thing. This is going to lock specifically. So um, to um, basically mean you want the game running at exactly half of your monitor's refresh rate and you lock it at that refresh rate and then this app will then double that frame rate by interpolating between every other frame. So basically use something like RTSS or your driver software to cap the frame rate. So if you have a 120 Hertz monitor, you lock to 60 and then it will uh, appear to be 120 frames being shown to you, but half of them will be interpolated frames where again, quality could be hit or miss. You will also get, um, you know, 
increased latency, just like all of these other frame generation methods, although I don't see any specific numbers for what exact amount of latency would be added. I would imagine the amount that makes sense would be about half a frame of latency, since you're having to delay seeing that next you know, game engine frame by to split it down the middle with your interpolated frame anyway. Uh, but that's just me kind of uh, assuming it would work somewhat similar to what we've seen with these other versions. So, interesting stuff. I asked, I was curious, is this a, uh, you know, an open source interpolation method that's been released or did they develop them themselves or any other details on what's going on? And I got the reply uh, that this is a closed source method unaffiliated with NVIDIA or AMD that they've been, uh, has been worked on for a while now. Uh, and again, it's closer to AFMF than FSR3, uh, but they did give a bit more details on how it works. They're saying that uh, lossless scaling basically uses the default Windows capture service to capture the applications window. Uh, this is somewhat similar to like how uh, the OBS broadcast software, if you've used that before, um, like captures your, your desktop, uh, any window you want, that kind of a thing, I believe. Anyway, um, so meanwhile, the lossless scaling application essentially doing the work uh, externally from the game interpolating frames. So you can kind of think of it as actually being an overlay and the fake frames are being drawn inside the lossless scaling app. And then that's kind of overlaid over what the game's actually doing. Uh, however, that does mean that other overlays could break uh, LSFG or not accurately record its frame rate. So if you're looking at frame rate counters, they might not correctly report it. And that's a similar issue that AMD has with AFMF where their driver software will report the generated frames, but other uh, frame rate reporting apps might not. Um, anyway, so also saying that, you know, it can be a little bit wonky or, or have uh, compatibility stuff uh, just because Windows Capture Service wasn't exactly designed for this kind of thing, so there can be quirks. Anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting and I bring it to your guys' attention. However, again, I have not used it yet myself and um, the minimum recommended base frame rate is 60 going up to 120, but it would be better to be going from like 120 to 240. So obviously, as with other frame generation methods, but possibly even more so, the quality is worse the lower your frame rate is. So you want it, it, a higher frame rate, uh, the, you know, you don't want to necessarily go from 30 to 60. It might support doing that, but would the quality be any good? Again, haven't tested it myself yet. Anyway, in other AMD uh, uh, news, AMD is bringing Fidelity FX super resolution upscaling to YouTube and VLC videos. So that is um, basically the spatial upscaler, FSR, to upscale YouTube videos and VLC videos. Uh, this feels like a response to NVIDIA's um, uh, uh, video upscaling, I, I'm, yeah, RTX video super resolution. So this seems like competition to that, although this certainly seems to be more of just a spatial upscaler versus that one. I think uh, I think Nvidia's version is at least claiming to be a bit more, um, you know, machine learning driven. Maybe a little bit more going on there. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, thought I'd bring that your t to your attention before shifting over to some Intel news. So a lot of people are hoping that Intel's next gen of GPUs is coming soon and that it will be powerful. I've got some information on both of those fronts. We do have Intel reaffirming that XE2, which would be Battle Mage, is coming, and the hardware team is already moving on to Celestial. So to clear up Intel's naming scheme for their GPUs, if you're unaware, they're doing an alphabetical order code name. So we currently have Intel Arc, that begins with A. Their next generation is Battle Mage, that begins with B. And the third generation would be Celestial, that begins with C, you get the idea. So what they're actually saying is the hardware team is done with Battle Mage. They're working on Celestial. So it seems like Battle Mage is basically in the software side of things as far as most of the development. So it says over 30% of the Arc GPU team is working on Battle Mage software and the hardware team is fully committed to Celestial. Uh, this information I'm getting from videocards.com, but their source is PC World. And again, I will include all of my sources in the video description uh, as usual. Anyway, this is pretty interesting. Here's a direct quote from Intel's Tom Peterson. He says, uh, in regards to Battle Mage, it's coming, I'm excited about it. And all, all our engineers, you know how they are constantly doing their engineering things. 
Uh, I'd say about 30% of our engineers are working on Battle Mage, mostly on the software side because our hardware team is on the next thing, Celestial. So think about it as the Battle Mage has, al uh, has already had its first silicon in the labs, which is very exciting and there's more good news coming, which I can't talk about right now. I'm curious about that more good news. We have seen, speaking of frame generation, uh, uh, Intel has talked about extra SS, a frame extrapolation technology rather than interpolation technology in a recent research paper, but we haven't heard much about that actually coming out as a released product. So I'm curious if the more good news coming soon could be related to that, but that's just me speculating. Anyway, he's saying, I hope we're going to see it before the next CES. Um, so basically, next CS would be a year from now, so he's hoping we'll see Battle Mage before a year from now. That's not, uh, you know, reassuring as far as anytime super soon, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, that's pretty good information, but um, I have more information. So Battle Mage comes out, is it going to be any good? Do we have any idea how fast it will be? And I will caution us on not taking reading too much into this, but WCCF Tech has an article saying that there is a Battle Mage integrated GPU benchmark that has leaked out that shows it almost two times faster than in Alchemist, you know, Arc Alchemist uh, GPU uh, with the same uh, I, I GPU uh, in the same benchmark kind of test. So uh, if you dig into the details here, it's basically getting to the point where uh, you find a CPU with a 64 execution unit SKU running between 1.7 to 2.2 GHz uh, clock speeds. This chip offers a maximum GPU uh, processing performance of a little over 1,000. Now, this is a uh, Alchemist product. So then if you look at a Battle Mage product running this same test, the second chip that has been leaked is the Lunar Lake engineering sample, which has 20 cores and a clock speed of one gigahertz base up to 3.91 gigahertz boost clock, and also has 64 execution units and was running between 1.75 to 1.85 gigahertz clock speeds. This chip scored a max GPU processing performance of almost 2000. Uh, which would be an 80% increase over the Alchemist iGPU, uh, again, running the same amount of cores. Sounds like my kids are getting home, so if you hear any noise, that's what's going on there. Anyway, also, apparently, we're looking at an Alchem the chip running Alchemist is a 65 to 125 watt rated chip, whereas the Lunar Lake engineering sample is a 17 watt chip. That's really interesting. Now, this is one particular test, and it's not even a gaming test. This is uh, SI software. Do I say SIS software, SI software? I don't know. But this is a GPU processing benchmark, but not a gaming benchmark, and that is very important to note. And this is just one score that has leaked out. So don't read way too much into this, but I would say that's at least very promising. Uh, because if, yeah, man, the thing is like gen on gen, AMD and NVIDIA, uh, it's going to be a much bigger struggle to get something like an 80% performance in improvement on the same number of cores or something like that. Whereas uh, with Intel, the fact that uh, Arc Alchemist was their first generation means there are there's probably easier like lower hanging fruit when it comes to problems with the architecture, which actually means it's easier to get larger generational performance gains by finding those easy to fix solutions generation to generation. So it it's actually not unreasonable to expect Intel to have a massive generational performance uplift. I'm not saying they will, but it's not unreasonable to expect uh, given the fact that um, it's probably, like I said, easier to find big underlying problems uh, and then fix those to get large performance gains, whereas more mature architectures uh, would be harder to find those big improvements. Anyway, uh, that's what I've got for you about Battle Mage, but it's not my only Intel news. So do you remember when Intel's 14th gen CPUs, and only some of them, not even all of them, got a, uh, a software 
um, application optimization for a couple specific games. It was called APO. Didn't work in many games. It only supported two 14th gen processors and there was no announcement that it would ever support other processors and no guarantee that it would for sure even come to other games. Apparently, Intel is now saying that it will come to their 12th and 13th gen hybrid CPUs after all. This is being reported by PC Gamer. That's cool, and it's a good thing because it sounds like, and, and there was pushback on this from, from channels doing testing on this. I know Hardware Unboxed, uh, I think Gamers Nexus as well, mentioning when they tested this that like, cool, but if the 14th gen CPUs are really just 13th gen CPUs, why wouldn't these same software optimizations apply, right? Seems like a forced thing to try to give the 14th gen something, uh, something to distinguish it from the 12th and 13th gen, especially from the 13th gen. Uh, but anyway, sounds like uh, it could actually be coming to um, those older generations as well, which is good news for people who own those. Hopefully it also comes to more games, we'll see. Now, let's move on to some NVIDIA news. So again, we've recently had the RTX 40 Super announcements. Uh, NVIDIA gave some performance numbers, but a lot of them were slides with like frame generation enabled and often uh, compared against like previous generations, like 20 series and 30 series GPUs, rather than, than against other 40 series GPUs, things like that. Uh, WCCF Tech is reporting on a uh, leak that apparently is showing some slides uh, showing performance numbers of the um, of the super cards versus other cards. It looks like for the most part, it is setting the uh, 4070 super, uh, sorry, the RTX 4070 as a 100% baseline. And then it is slotting in um, other cards, you know, scaling up from there. So for example, a 4090 at 201% means it is double the performance of a 4070. That's what that's how, how you would read this. So then they're saying the 4080 Super is 72% faster than the 4070. The 4070 Super is 10% faster than the 4070. And the 4070 Ti Super is 38% faster than the 4070. Uh, you could then uh, talk about what that would mean in terms of value and, and things like that. So is this real? Is this true? Who is this from? What testing is it based on? I don't know. <laughs> but here's what I will tell you. Um, if you calculate this out, uh, that would indicate the 4080 Super is 8% faster than the 4080 non-Super. The 4070 Ti Super is 11% faster than the non-Super 4070 Ti. And the 4070 Super is 10% faster versus the non-Super lineup. However, the other thing I'll tell you is um, when I had my uh, pre-briefing with NVIDIA and I asked them how much faster is a 4080 Super than a 4080 non-Super, they told me it's only two or 3% faster. Uh, so if you compare that to what we're seeing here, which is claiming 8% faster, to me that sounds unlikely because NVIDIA would be more likely to inflate their performance improvements than to understate them if, you, if you're in a marketing meeting, right? So uh, uh, NVIDIA would likely either be accurate or overstate. Um, this being an understatement, uh, I mean, this result being um, a better result than what the, the NVIDIA rep told me, to me, makes it sound unlikely, although if it depends on what it's testing, because these were theoretically average results not individual results, where individual results might show a better result. How do, uh, again, these numbers that I were told to me from NVIDIA stack up against the other claims? Uh, NVIDIA did tell me the 4070 Ti Super would be t about 10% faster on average, but sometimes 15% faster, but 10% on average, versus the 4070 Ti non-Super. And that does line up pretty closely to what we're seeing here, which is an 11% number. And then the 4070 Super, this source is claiming 10% faster than the 4070 non-Super. And my, uh, again, Intel rep just told me it's 15% faster than the 4070 non-Super and 5% slower than the 4070 Ti non-Super. 
So that, again, is a bit off from what uh, I got from, uh, again, the pre-briefing with NVIDIA. So make of it, you, uh, it what you will. Personally, I would probably say that NVIDIA's numbers are probably more accurate than this random leak, but none of it's independent third-party testing in a fully published review. This is possibly independent third-party testing, but we don't really know anything about what it is, right? Um, so anyway, uh, we'll have to kind of uh, make of that uh, what we will, and I'm going to go ahead and move along. Uh, we're seeing some interesting handheld news coming out of CES. Last time I reported on MSI Claw using Intel Arc graphics, which is pretty interesting. Now we've got A and Neo saying their next light uh, is going to come with SteamOS. So, so far, one of the big things setting the Steam Deck apart from almost all of the competitors, like the ROG Ally, that MSI Claw I mentioned, the Legion Go, a million other things, is that those other things usually run Windows. Uh, SteamOS uh, is one of my favorite things about the Steam Deck. Everything just, it, it feels more like a gaming console. It just boots into SteamOS, everything runs perfectly on a controller. I never wish that I had a keyboard unless I'm running a game that just isn't really supported well for, for uh, a controller. You know what I mean? Um, anyway, Valve in the past has talked about being open to uh, other handheld gaming PCs running SteamOS. I don't think Valve's main goal with the Steam Deck is to make money on the hardware. It's to get more people using Steam and buying games on Steam right? And also to get an operating system up that's not dependent on Windows, uh, because I think long term, uh, I think Valve would feel more comfortable if gaming happened more on a, a, a non-Windows OS. And if it was Steam OS, all the better, right? So it makes sense that Valve would be open to this. Um, now, I'm curious if this is coming with official support from Valve, or if this is something more done by a Neo. Apparently, this is the quote, the SteamOS pre-installed on Next Lite is adapted and optimized by Aeneo based on Hollow ISO. I'm not a Linux expert, so I don't know a lot about this, guys. I'm just reporting it. Maybe some of you in the comments know more. Users also can install, can install Windows system by themselves after purchasing Next Lite and download Windows drivers. So they're saying you could still install Windows yourself. Uh, we have another quote here. Again, this is a translation. ANEO Next Lite comes with the SteamOS gaming system pre-installed for the first time. While maintaining the top-tier flagship design and texture, it seamlessly integrates cost-effective lowering, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the point is, um, it's unclear to me if this has, like I said, official like support from Valve helping, helping it integrate well onto this hardware or not. Um, also, the pricing on this thing on the website apparently is currently $1,300. So that's pretty expensive. Hopefully there's some sort of cheaper option or this is offering something pretty uh, crazy cool. But overall, I am very interested in SteamOS being more available to these gaming handhelds. Anyway, um, in other news, Asus at CES is showing off their cable-free RTX 4090 BTF, Back to the Future GPU. Um, now... What's going on with these? Unlike some other cableless looking GPUs, which hide the power connector, Asus's BTF design just eliminates the power connector in the traditional sense and replaces it with this plug that plugs directly into one of their BTF motherboards and only one of their BTF motherboards, which is to me the massive downside to this. Um, I had a call a month or two ago, uh, a video call with an Asus rep where they ran a lot of product ideas by me, you know, whatever. And I was overall very negative about this with them because I said, look, if you buy an extremely expensive graphics card and then you want to update it, most people sell the graphics card. Um, who is going to want to buy your used graphics card with this connector? That seems like the, the biggest problem with this whole situation is it just utterly destroys the resale, resale value of the GPU. However, um, there is apparently a potential solution to that with this adapter. This adapter 
plugs into the GPU and then gives you this power plug to then um, be able to plug in a traditional uh, you know, 12 volt uh, power connector. Um, the problem then though is if you look at where this connector is on the GPU, uh, that there's a lot of motherboards where you just be running right up against the motherboard with this thing or case and this could po cause problems. Although of course you could vertically mount or perhaps be on some sort of a, uh, you know, uh, ITX motherboard or in the right case. So in other words, it at least does give some sort of a solution to using this GPU if you're not plugging it into a BTF motherboard but I still think this is gonna make the resale value on these things kind of plummet. In my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, let me know in the comment section, but that's my main problem with this design. Anyway, uh, in more interesting design, how about an RTX 4070 Ti fitting into an, a single fan ITX card? Now this is not something going on sale, it is a custom prototype uh, being shown off on Reddit by uh, Tech Taxi on Reddit. And apparently it's also not entirely a finished design, but I just think it's really cool. It hasn't had thermal testing yet. So basically, uh, you would expect there to be uh, have to be a pretty significant undervolt to make this cooling actually work, in which case, how much performance are you losing? I don't know, but it seems pretty interesting. And, um, you know, we don't have cards like that on the market. I wish more GPUs would take advantage of the efficiency of the 40 series. They don't use all that much power. So uh, I think a lot of the cooler designs could be smaller, but uh, you know, I think people see bigger GPU, think better and then buy those. So those probably sell better, but I know a lot of people would be interested in smaller GPUs for certain builds. Anyway, Colorful is unveiling its NVIDIA GeForce RTX 40 Super GPU lineup. And I've already reported on a bunch of other brands that had revealed these. We're now seeing the Colorful designs. So um, here you go. This is uh, an article at WCCF Tech. Apparently that image is gonna choose not to load. But anyway, so we've got a number of designs available. And check them out, 40 Supers coming up soon, so you might wanna be planning on, if you're buying one, which, uh, which GPU model you will be looking at. Could also depend on the pricing. Let's get into a little bit of game news before we're done. Helldivers 2 PC specs are out, and uh, this article saying they're quite demanding. We could take a look at them. This is a P uh, PS5 exclusive on console, but is also launching on, and I think it's published by PlayStation, I believe. Uh, but it is coming to PC at the same time. I think that's their plan for live service games to get a larger install base right away, is, is to actually not delay the PC version, but to launch on PC at the same time. Um, it's looking like we do have some specs for 1080p 30, 1080p 60, 1440p 60, and 4K 60, with the graphic settings there being low, medium, high, and very high. Again, obviously knowing even more would be cool, but basically 1080p 30 low looks to be a GTX 1050 Ti or an RX 470, so I don't think that's too crazy, especially for a PS5 game and eight gigabytes of RAM and a, uh, a Core i7-4790K or Ryzen 5 1500X. If you wanna move on up to, let me zoom out a bit here. If you wanna move uh, on up to 1080p 60 at medium settings, an RTX, uh, this is GTX 2060. I think they mean RTX 2060 or, uh, or an RX 6600 XT. Again, I don't think that's too crazy to be honest. And 1440p 60 at high settings, a 3070 or a 6800 seems pretty reasonable to me, honestly. And then 4K Ultra, yeah, okay, a 4070 Ti or a 7900 XTX. That is pretty beefy, but that's 4K 60 at very high settings in a PS5 game. So um, anyway, if you were interested in that one, there you go. And some quick news to wrap things up. We are apparently seeing a the next Halo game reportedly in development using Unreal Engine 5. And this is uh, along the lines of other rumors we'd already seen about the next 343 Halo game moving to Unreal Engine 5. 
And this is coming from this tweet here, according to Justin, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that last name, whatever, Arc Director, Art Director's LinkedIn page, 343 has been working on the next unannounced Halo release since April 2022. And um, uh, Ian Slutz, has, uh, who's a senior character system designer, has been building player systems and assets in Unreal Engine 5. So interesting, another franchise looking to move to Unreal Engine 5. And Cyberpunk 2077's sequel uh, is apparently beginning development. And as far as we know, CD Projekt is also moving to Unreal Engine 5 for that development. Uh, we're getting some quotes about this uh, from developer tweets saying, first day in Boston office, so good to meet old friends and officially kickstart our Orion journey. Orion would be the code name for CD Projekt's follow-up to uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Anyway, saying, I couldn't be more excited for this project. I'm sure we can make it something special. 2077 was just a warm-up. Uh, getting some other quotes talking about uh, moving on to the next Cyberpunk game. So it's looking like uh, cyber next Cyberpunk is in development. Uh, over there, and like I said, I believe we're expecting Unreal Engine 5. And last thing is a little bit of Steam news. It's looking like they're revising their policy on games that use AI, uh, which I believe previously was pretty restrictive, and now uh, apparently is being updated to allow the vast majority of games. Anyway, that's what I've got for you guys today. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Huge thank you to channel subscribers and an even huger thank you to people who clicked the join button, channel members who directly support the channel financially. That is amazing to me that anybody's willing to do that for me and that is very, very helpful. So please, so thank you for doing that. But if you can't support financially, totally understand the views help and that still helps me financially because YouTube ads and whatnot and everything. So anyway, uh, I hope everybody has an awesome day and I will report back if there is any more CES PC gaming hardware news.